How's it going there, everybody? This is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing, back again with another video. Excited to talk with you guys uh, with somebody in the legal space. This is Jeffrey Hoffman. Um, he is a cannabis attorney. Um, he is the owner of Jeffrey Hoffman and Associates. I'm really excited to talk with him, uh, discuss some of the latest trends, um, new news in the cannabis industry. How are you doing today, Jeffrey? Absolutely outstanding. Awesome. Well, hey, let's jump right into this. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your journey as a legal professional? Sure. So I've been getting high since Reagan. I got my law degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1998. Most of my career has been in something else. I've always been an activist about cannabis, but obviously here in the United States, you couldn't really make a living as an attorney related to cannabis other than as a criminal attorney. So I had a bunch of tech companies and then here up in New York City, um, we did the deal with Nathan's Famous. So we had 60 Nathan's Famous hot dog carts all over Manhattan. And then COVID destroyed that business. And uh, literally on a phone call with my mom one day, she was like, well, now that COVID has destroyed that business, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep being in the food industry? Are you going to go back to tech? And I said, you know, Ma, here during COVID, the state of New York legalized cannabis, and I'm living here in New York City, and I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to try to become the top cannabis attorney in the state of New York. And that was, uh, that was the goal and seems to be what we're doing. So outside of uh, the, the pandemic, um, do you have any other reasoning for why you decided to specialize in cannabis specifically? So I always wanted to. It was just simply that other than being a cannabis attorney, you I mean, a, a criminal attorney, you couldn't really be involved in cannabis. There were no businesses. You know, most of my legal career has been as a, what you might call a business attorney doing contracts and and leases and negotiations. Although I will say as as uh, cannabis has gotten legalized, I've been very involved in getting records expunged and getting people out of jail. I got the last prisoner projects guy in New Jersey out of jail. His name was Umberto Ramirez. He was serving two to seven there. And, and me and a wonderful woman, Kathleen Redpath Perez, managed to get him out. Um, he was a nonviolent cannabis offender. So I'm a big believer in those issues. But you know, it's simply a matter of unless you were going to do the criminal work, there was not a place for you in the legal profession related to cannabis. Uh, and finally, here in New York, once New York legalized, there was a place for people that wanted to be an attorney in the cannabis space and not just in the criminal space, right? Yeah, and I think I speak for everyone when I say how awesome it is that you're helping people who are guilty of nonviolent crimes, um, helping them get out, um, especially for marijuana charges. So thank you for that. Um, what kind of clients... Uh, would you say these are the kind of the clients that you enjoy serving the most? Or what kind of clients would you say you enjoy serving the most? Sure. So all our firm does is cannabis work. We don't do any work that's, that doesn't touch cannabis. Um, my favorite, and I mean, it's like, can a parent really have favorite children? So I don't want to say really favorite, but kind of what I really care about. New York has done it, or is at least attempting to do it differently than other states have done it. There's a tremendous focus on equity. The very first retail licenses were given to folks that had cannabis convictions. Um, I think I represent somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the people that got those licenses. It's just it's incredibly important. Right. I, I do not feel that government can come in and say, you know, we basically destroyed your life and, and your community and we destroyed any opportunities for your communities to build wealth because of these anti-cannabis enforcement policies. And now that it's good for us to legalize, we're just going to make all the money and you guys get to deal with your convictions and good luck to you. I, I don't think that's appropriate. And I've been fighting tooth and nail against that. So I do think New York is trying to do it with equity in mind. Um, they are a little bit challenged. The, the regulations that we created here in New York, unfortunately, did not match the law very well. So there have been a lot of people that have been able to successfully sue about that. But we're going to keep trying. And, uh, and really, I do think that that is, is kind of the difference. That's something that I really care about is that we are, we are going to the people whose lives our government destroyed due to them being in cannabis and trying to make some kind of amends for that. Yeah, I think one, one thing I'm kind of interested in is um, uh, clearly you have a lot of connections in the state of New York. Um, you know, a lot of us, uh, for myself, for example, when I made this marketing agency, we niched down to cannabis to kind of become an expert and specialize in the industry. 
And it seems like you're doing something similar. Would you, would you say that you've had some success kind of getting some good uh, strategic partnerships, maybe, or I don't know what, what the best way to find oh, yeah. is. Uh, go ahead. Ab- yeah. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I really started cranking it up. I mean, again, I was an activist and I cared and I would say, yeah, you ought to expunge these records. I mean, there's a video of me from, I think, 2013, I think is the year. So us lawyers have to take continuing legal education, CLEs. And I do believe I've taught one of, if not the first CLEs about adult use or recreational legalization in early 2013, right after Colorado and Washington legalized. And, uh, you know, we were talking about expungement all the way back then. Like, if you're going to legalize this and and you governments are going to make a ton of money over this, you really need to clear up the convictions of the people who were doing the same thing before you decided it ought to be legal. Right. So so it's just that was what I was doing before. And once it became possible to, like, be a business lawyer here in New York and like do what I'm competent to do, I just went crazy. I literally for the first year of the mar- of the market and probably the first two years from when they legalized, I was literally at every cannabis event in the state that happened. And um, I, I one of the best things that I did personally so you know, you know what an AMA and ask me anything is on on Reddit, right? Yeah. So when I was doing this is when LinkedIn and LinkedIn is the one social media website that will let you post pretty much with impunity about cannabis. You know, if you post too much about cannabis on Instagram, you'll get shadow banned and eventually banned, and then your profile will get taken down. The whole thing. LinkedIn, unless you like are saying here's ounces for a hundred dollars, LinkedIn will pretty much let you get away with anything. So I was looking at LinkedIn and realized, hey, this is the platform where you can do pretty much anything with cannabis. And they, they, they were late to the game about allowing video. You can now connect things like StreamYard to LinkedIn and broadcast. But they were really late to do this, and they really started doing it around this time that cannabis legalization happened in New York. So I said, huh. How can I get a competitive advantage over other attorneys? Well, most attorneys won't say boo to you until they pay your retainer, till you pay their retainer, right? So I said, how about I get on LinkedIn and every Wednesday at 4.20 p.m. New York City time, I do ask me anything about cannabis legalization in New York. And I'll answer everybody's questions and we'll just let everybody know stuff that normally they'd have to pay attorneys thousands of dollars for. And it took off like crazy. And then if you're familiar with the term paper of record from back in the day when we had newspapers, it's basically whatever the media organization is that is like when people want to know what's up, that's where they go. So I think a lot of people tend to think that kind of the, you know, despite what some people may think it's it's liberal bias, and I don't agree with that, but whatever, uh, the New York Times is kind of the paper of record for us in this day and age. The paper of record in New York cannabis is the New York Cannabis Insider. It's a website that's done by the the media organization that controls Syracuse.com and all the radio stations and newspapers up that way towards Syracuse. And they said to me, hey, it looks like you're doing a good thing here. We'd like to syndicate it every week in our and on our website, we just like to publish a transcript, you can edit it, of your show every week. And I mean, are you kidding me? That just blew it up. So that was like the best partnership I could possibly make. And now everybody in the state knows who I am and like I'm who they come to to ask questions. And what does that turn into? Oh, well, you answered my question and now I have real legal needs. I guess I know who I'm going to hire, right? So that was really a real competitive advantage for me. Yeah, I really like the strategy of kind of giving out free information like that, just kind of putting yourself out there, making yourself known, um, obviously with the eventual goal of them eventually hiring you, right? That's what, what the goal is here with this uh, free information. That yeah, I mean, we, we, well, so look, I want to be very clear about that because a lot of people say that, but it's not entirely true for me. Yes, I got to pay rent and buy food just like everybody does, and I've chosen to live in the most expensive city in the United States, so I need a little more than people need in other places. <laughs> that being said... What's number one for me is getting the information out, right? I'm a big believer in disintermediating, if that's the right word, between 
power centers that use information as a cudgel against the public and getting that information to the public, right? I'm just, I'm a big believer in that. And I don't think we in the legal profession do a really good job of making what we do understandable to the layperson. And I get it. The reason we do that is because we want them to pay us to explain it to them, right? But that's not where I'm at, right? I'm all about like, if you really need to get me into the weeds about your problem in your business, yeah, you need to pay me. But like, if you just need to know how far a cannabis dispensary needs to be from a school, I got no problem telling you it needs to be 500 feet, right? So, you know, there you go. Yeah. Well, let's jump actually into the, the, kind, of the kind of the latest news here. Um, as you know, everybody's been talking about it, the rescheduling. Um, I'm really curious about your professional opinion on that. Can, can you discuss some of the implications of cannabis being rescheduled? Uh, so the biggest one is there has to be a, a, just a nonstop party going on over in the boardroom and in the general counsel's office and in the legal departments at Pfizer and CVS and Lilly and all those companies because they're going to own cannabis in the United States if this continues on the path we're going on. Uh, those companies are not damaged and have no standing to sue as long as cannabis is Schedule One, that makes it federally illegal, and there's nothing, you know, Pfizer can't make products with THC, and CVS can't sell products with THC, right? The moment it becomes Schedule Three, which is pharmaceutical, it's the same as codeine and every other, you know, pharmaceutical drug we have, those companies are now damaged, right? Every state-run cannabis program is taking money out of their pockets. So if I'm the general counsel of Pfizer, the moment rescheduling becomes complete and official, and I think that's a long time from now if ever, and we can unpack that a little more if you want, but the moment that happens, I immediately sue every state that has anything going on about cannabis and say, Your Honor, immediately shut down these illegal state-run cannabis programs. I am damaged. They are taking profits out of my pockets every single day they're open. And let me tell you, friend, they're right, and they're going to win that lawsuit, okay? So that's where we're headed with rescheduling is Pfizer and CVS owns it. It doesn't mean that everybody that's in these illegal and, – and I'm the one helping them get into these illegals. I mean, look, it's all still federally illegal, right? But – those folks will be able to go and get pharmaceutical licenses just like the pharmaceutical manufacturers and the and the pharmacies. But like how expensive and impossible is it for these businesses to stay in business as it is? How many of them are going to be able to go and get pharmaceutical licenses? Very few, if none. And so that'll be the end. So great. Let's do it. Everybody can celebrate not having to pay 280E anymore as they go out of business and get sued to go out of business. Sounds good. Have a good one. Uh huh. So, what what do you think is the best solution to kind of help save our state run programs? Um, unscheduled. Unscheduled. Okay. What what not is not best... schedule unscheduled. Uh huh. But what would be the and best part for is, doing that? Uh, Joe Biden directing the like ordering ordering because last I checked, all of these people work for him. Ordering, descheduling like. Attorney General, what's his name? I forget the Attorney General's name. Whatever the hell his name is. Attorney General so-and-so. I order you to remove cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act. I order you. Um, so actually, yeah. They work for him. They work for him. And the AG says, I don't want to do it. You're fired. Who's next up? That That's the quickest path. And honestly, that's actually a possibility. I'm not a political expert. Here. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. Why, why, why not? Why, I, 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 go ahead. So, so Joe Biden got elected, I'm sure got your vote, on I care about all these cannabis prisoners. Oh, yeah, I care, man. There are very few powers in the world where one person has an absolute right to do something impactful and no one can review it or say boo about it. One of those powers happens to be the federally or the constitutionally enumerated power of the president of the United States to pardon federal crimes without review, period, full stop. The day President Biden took office in January of 21, he could immediately have pardoned 
every single cannabis crime that had ever occurred in the history of the United States. And we'd be done and we wouldn't be talking about this. He didn't. He's not going to. It's a question about whether or not you should vote for him. I mean, you should because the alternative is a big, pro a much bigger problem. But hey, whatever, you know. So that's why. So you don't see any sort of possibility of uh, maybe let's let's say uh, let's do a very uh, op open open ended scenario here where let's say Donald Trump wins in November, uh, Biden's on his way out. Maybe in the last twenty days or whatever, he might give that give that sort of order. Do you, do you see that as a? I think more likely that he does it as a hail mary when he realizes he's seven points down in the swing states he needs to win come October. Huh. Yeah, no, it'll be definitely interesting to watch that. I was actually talking, but it to won't. You. It won't. It won't but, save him. Yeah, it won't save him. I was talking to a, a pharmacologist. He's not super connected on that, but he. He was thinking that that's probably was going to happen. You know, who knows? We'll see what's going to happen. Um, another interesting topic um, that I would like to hear your opinion on is kind of the, the what a lot of people refer to as a legal loophole for these uh, Delta Eights and the THCAs in the the Farm Bill. And I'm curious yeah. about what your thoughts are on that, and specifically the, 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 that. the states are taking care of it on a state by state basis here in New York. There, none of them are allowed. Right. The regulator took care of that. Um, I'm sure there'll be lawsuits. The only people that win when you start suing about this stuff are the lawyers, you know, so have at it, I guess. Um, I think it's all a mess. We got to see what the new farm bill is, how, you know, what their re up of the farm bill is going to look like. We got to see how all this plays out between now and the election. Uh, but I told all the people here in New York that were like, oh, yeah, I'm going to spool up a $2 million facility and I can't wait. I'm like, don't do it. You're going to, you're going to, and I and just, I can't, just, I got, I know folks that are like, well, what do I do now? And I'm like, I don't know. Good luck to you. So, so I think it's a real problem. Um, obviously, the states that hate this are finally figuring it out. So they're going to all make it illegal. Um, I think the states that have legal cannabis are going to go against it because it's a loophole for them collecting their tax revenue that they're going to get through the normal stores, through the licensed full THC stores. So, you know, I just I love the machinations that we as humans go through to try to get around the rules that we make for ourselves. I mean, it's just the most <laughs> mind boggling thing to me in the whole world. Right. Like. We all want cannabis to be legal, but not this way and not that way. And here's a loophole, but let's close the loophole. I mean, who wins from all of this? There's only one group that wins from all of this. Guess who? You know, it's funny. Uh, while we're on the topic, uh, I'm currently living abroad in Peru. I mean, you can find these Delta 8s and all those sorts of products that come from the United States in Peru. Um, and technically, they're legal under the same loophole that's kind of active in the United States, which is kind of interesting to see how you trickle down um, internationally. Um, we just have about five minutes here, um, so I do have two more questions. Hopefully, we can get through both of them. Um, one, I was, kind of, I was hoping you could kind of share a story, um, what your, maybe your favorite victory or your favorite success story uh, working in the legal industry as a cannabis uh, attorney. Uh, it, yeah, it's got to be getting Umberto Ramirez out of jail, right? So he was uh, doing two to seven in New Jersey for a trunk full of cannabis that he was going to split up with his buddies. Um and I met – so here – I mean it's a great story overall. So there's a, a cannabis event in, uh, in the U.S. called MJ Unpacked. It goes from, from – to various cities. In May of 22 and literally the anniversary was literally two days ago, I was at MJ Unpacked. It was at the time – it was at the Midtown Hilton here in New York City. My dad was born in the Bronx, but was in the military, so I didn't actually live here in New York City a lot, or at all, really. We would come back and visit, so we traveled around a lot while he was in the military, but we would come back a lot. And it just so happens that the Midtown Hilton, where MJ Unpacked used to be, was the hotel we would stay in literally every time we would come here when I was a kid. So it was a bit of a weird flashback. But so the event is up in the ballrooms up at MJ Unpacked. We go down to the outside the hotel to, to get high. And out there is uh, Umberto's wife, Brooke, with a sign basically saying, you know, my, son, my husband is in prison for a nonviolent non cannabis crime in, uh, in New Jersey. Do basically do any of you care, right? 
you know, basically you business people. And so I w- walked up to her while I was getting high and I said, tell me something about this. And, and again, I'm not really a criminal lawyer, but since that day, I've become a big one. And she explained it all to me. And I was like, look, I'm not a criminal lawyer. I don't really know a, a whole lot about this, but I promise you we're going to get your husband out of jail. And I had no idea how we were going to do it. Nothing. I just, that was it. And then after that, I started looking into it and thinking about it. And I met Kathleen, who I mentioned to you over in New Jersey, and we looked into it some more, and it turned out that the attorney general in New Jersey had issued a directive that all nonviolent drug offenders were to be rescheduled without mandatory minimums. So as I told you before, my guy, Umberto, Bert, as we call him, was in for two to seven. That's a minimum two. So the directive was re-sentence without the, without, the, without the mandatory minimum, which would have just been a straight seven. Well, of course, New Jersey is you know half liberal and half uh, conservative, and the conservative parts are down to the south. The most conservative county in New Jersey is probably Cape May, that area down there. And, of course, where was my guy's conviction and what DA did we have to deal with? Cape May. So, of course, they didn't want to do it. And, in fact, the way the state originally did it is they brought a judge out of retirement to to handle it on a mass level. And the first thing the judge did was write a memo that said the attorney general's uh, memo has no power of law. And I'm not going to do this. So the ACLU sued. They won. But still, the conservative DAs didn't want to do it. So we went down to Cape May, Kathleen specifically, and talked to the DA and said, look, we both know you have to do this. Unless you want us to make life really difficult and ugly for you, how about we just do it? And he said, okay. So we got my guy resentenced. So instead of the two to seven, he got a straight seven. And guess what? Based on the time he had served, he's eligible to get out. So we get him out, right? I mean, it was what a what an amazing way to do it, right? Like so from not being a criminal guy, not really knowing anything about this, I meet literally last prisoner projects guy in New Jersey who they've been working on forever. And we figure out a way to get him out, right? Yeah, that's Hallelujah. Awesome. That's yeah, good times. Yeah, one more quick question for you, and then I understand you have to go. Um, How do you envision the next five years in the cannabis industry? What's going to happen? What what does your crystal ball say? So New York City already is and will continue to be the cannabis capital of the world. Full stop, mic drop. Um, It used to be Amsterdam. Amsterdam is going 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Um, Their mayor there is so liberal that she makes me look like a knuckle-dragging troglodyte, and I'm pretty liberal, Um, and she wants to limit cannabis consumption. In fact, wanted to go as far as limiting uh, foreigners' ability to buy cannabis in the coffee shops, right? It used to be you could buy in any coffee shop in in the Netherlands. Um, It's now been limited that tourists can only buy in Amsterdam, and she wanted to limit it even further. New York City has taken over the mantle from Amsterdam, Um, not for reasons that the regulators really want. Um, There are now probably five to 10,000 illegal stores selling cannabis in New York City, which means it is easier to get cannabis in New York City than anywhere else on planet Earth. The state of New York happens to be the only comprehensive jurisdiction where it's 100% legal to smoke cannabis anywhere you can smoke a cigarette. So between the ease of getting it and the ability to consume it so easily, New York City is really the cannabis capital of the world. I anticipate that will continue. Bigger picture, though, I think there's going to be some real challenges. we got to see what's going to happen with this rescheduling thing, which I think is terrible. I would rather – I mean I get it. You, you, the, you, there's the 280E problem, but I think we're going to get, we're going to, by solving that problem, we're going to get a bunch of other problems, but maybe I'm wrong. We'll see. But I do think more and more places are going to legalize. I think Republicans, once uh, family members start getting cancer, they realize that, oh, you know, eating some, can- I mean, eating some edibles is a really good way to boost my appetite when I'm on chemo, right? So like North Carolina, another state that I'm licensed in, That's one of the few states that doesn't have anything legal, no adult use, no medical. Every year now, for the last couple of years, the state Senate has passed a bad medical cannabis bill, but at least a medical cannabis bill. The Assembly, I mean the House 
in the assembly down there, never even brings it up to a vote. Maybe they will next session because the speaker, who's the guy that's been preventing it, is the one that always prevents it. But like literally this last session, the member in the Senate who was a Republican, who I don't know if it was him or a member of his family, I do think it was him that had cancer and went through chemo and was like dosed by, well, you know, given some edibles or whatever by one of their family members or smoked out by one of their families. Like, oh my God, I'm hungry again. You know, went to the 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 hearing on it in the House and was like, my fellow Republicans, I get you all hate this, but let me tell you a story about how you're harming our fellow citizens. And it fell on deaf ears. But but that's where we are right now. It's like we can't even get people to agree that like helping people through their chemo is a good thing, right? <laughs> I mean it just boggles my mind, right? So that's where we are. And as long as we have to fight that, still we're really still in for an uphill battle. And I do think – that Republicans are going to take complete control of the federal government here in in the election in November. I mean, I do think there is a pathway for that not to happen, but I do think that's the odds on. Like, if I was going to bet on something, that's what I would bet on. And then all bets are off as far as any of this, right? Yeah. Well, thanks again, Jeffrey. And the, uh, for everybody listening, this is Jeffrey Hoffman. I will leave his information in the video link in the description so you can get a hold of him. Um, any final words you want to say to kind of pitch your services, Jeffrey? Yeah, every every Wednesday at 4.20 p.m. New York City time, go to LinkedIn. I do Ask Me Anything about cannabis legalization in New York. You can also go to my website, which, which is 420jurist.com. That is 420jurist.com. And uh, come on down. We're happy to talk to you. Awesome. Well, great talking with you, Jeffrey. Definitely wish you the best and hope to hear from you soon. Thank you, sir. Rock and roll.